Okay, well, I want to thank uh, Harold Fritsch, and as he will understand, especially K.K. Foy, yeah, for the invitation. And um, I noticed in the program there is a punctuation there. There is a comma between entanglement and entropy, which completely changes the meaning of the talk. And this reminds me of a book on punctuation, which has four words and one comma, which is famous mainly for the title. Does anyone know what the title of the book is? It's actually what could be a sign in front of the panda some of us saw yesterday. Nobody knows this famous book. The title of the book is Eats, Comma, Shoots and Leaves, which is it's a very clever how a comma can completely change the meaning. <laughs> okay, so, and I hope you tell me f five minutes at the end. I want to, um, uh, since I gave the title of this talk to Harold about six months ago, I've actually worked more on this, what I call afterward, on dark matter. And I'm writing a paper, and I promised to send a copy to our hero, Carla Rubia, before the end of March. And he promised to look at it, which of course might take only 10 seconds, if I can find his email. Um, anyway, so the main talk is on the paper without a comma, uh, which has been, is going to appear in the physics of the dark universe, thanks to Professor Amandola and the quality of the paper, hopefully. And at the paper, uh, which I'm going to talk about in the last five minutes, if you remind, if you remind me, kindly remind me, is this paper about uh, dark matter. Now, some of this is, uh, I'll go through quickly. So this is the main talks about co cyclic cosmology, where you have an infinite number of cycles, um, where you have expansion, turnaround, contraction, bounce. And this is very appealing and has been worked on by various people for almost a hundred years, including Einstein and uh, De Sitter and of course Tolman and uh, Lemaitre, or everybody and Friedman, they all said it should be cyclic, as you can, from the history. Now, um, one of the reasons that, uh, the main reason Nobody followed that up after about 1931 was a, a, a paper by Richard Chase Tolman who proved that it was impossible based on the second law of thermodynamics. I don't have time to explain that, but uh, when the thing that makes the cyclic universe more likely is actually the discovery of dark energy in 1998, which completely changes some of the aspects of uh, uh, one of the key assumptions in Tolman's No-Go Theorem of 1931. <coughs> and um, we wrote a paper in 2007 where we introduced with somebody called Lawrence, Lars Baum, which introduced an idea called comeback empty, which is the idea that the contracting universe actually contains no contains only dark energy and no matter or black holes and so on. And it comes, it comes back with zero entropy adiabatically. Now, what I want to introduce in this paper is a very interesting idea, which has been around for about 10 years, called entanglement entropy. Because it turns out that this idea of entanglement entropy fits, is sort of tailor-made to discuss cyclic cosmology, um, which was not what it was designed for, as far as I know. And it shows, in a way, how quantum mechanics, of all things, uh, is relevant not only to the beginning of the universe, maybe, for the fluctuations and so on. Actually, quantum mechanics is even relevant to the end of the universe, so to speak, the turnaround in a quite surprise, you know, completely unexpected way. Now this idea, there's a very important idea, which is certainly not my idea, is due to a gentleman called 
Van Ramsdonk, who looks Dutch, but is actually Canadian, and I've never met him. <laughs> but he had a very—he wrote a very good essay for the Gravity Research Foundation in 2010, and it won the first prize, as it should. It's probably the best essay they ever had, present company excluded. Uh, but what he pointed out by a simple argument of ADS-CFT is that the, um, the quantum entanglement vanishing is connected, or not vanishing, connects, is related to the disconnection or connection of classical of space-time manifolds. As you will see, this is uh, tailor-made for cyclic cosmology. <coughs> it also is probably relevant to the, the idea of quantum gravity, which nobody really knows how to do, but this suggests that the Einstein's equations in a four-dimensional space-time are perhaps related to consistency conditions on a conformal field series in the three-dimensional surface. <laughs> Disapproval. Well, I'm just saying the words, but this is a very uh, interesting idea. Uh, and there are several follow-up papers which suggest, uh, yeah, okay, can I go on? So, they're only, can, the Einstein's equations are some, yes, it's not, look, it's not, it's in an early stage. It's an immature. So, uh, to show why the discovery of the accelerated expansion is relevant to cyclic cosmology, uh, I tried to do it very quickly. So, <coughs> Um, so the visible universe, which in, I call the introverse, and the rest of the universe I call the extraverse. The introverse is the same as the visible universe. So the radius, of the co-moving radius of the visible universe at the present time is, excuse me, uh, it's hard to know what to push. So this <coughs> there's 44 gigalight years. This is very important. So you can imagine the universe at the moment as a sphere with a radius, forget co-moving, if you like, it's 44 giga light years. And the present time is 13.8 giga years. Now, there's a more relevant, very more important time, is the time <coughs> four billion years ago when the dark energy started uh, the acceleration. Okay, and at that time, you can regard the visible universe and the extraverse as the same. But then the extraverse starts getting bigger exponentially. So for example, um, if you go back to that dark energy time, which is 9.8 billion years, the radius of the extraverse and the, uh, the introverse or visible universe are the same, 39 gigalight years. But the extraverse increases exponentially. And by the present time, you remember the visible universe is 44 gigalight years. The extraverse has a radius of 52 gigalight years. So this is something we cannot see. Oh, this keeps ch yeah, totally. Yeah, the, it's, I'm sorry, it pushes us. I have the same problem as normal. It changes spontaneously. So uh, now it turns out that at the turnaround time, which I don't really have time to explain how you derive it, but it's 1.3 trillion years with the assumptions of CBE and so on. At that time, the extraverse incre increases in radius from the present radius of 52 gigalight years to a fantastically big radius. Whereas, okay, look at this radius, 10 to the 42 gigalight years. Whereas the visible universe, which is determined by the speed of light, increases only from 44 gigalight years to 58 gigalight years. So it increases very, very slowly, so to speak, whereas the extraverse increases exponentially. <coughs> so by the time you reach the turnaround, the visible universe is an almost negligible fraction of the extraverse. This is actually very important to get the CBE working. So, um, 
for infinite cyclicity, uh, well, this is maybe too technical, but for infinite cyclicity, you have to make a uh, uh, matching condition between the contraction and the expansion. And this matching condition actually fixes the period of the cycle. And the period, as I already said, is 1.3 trillion years. Now, let's go back, since we're more concerned with the what well, we're concerned with the future and the past. Uh, wh where does the... Uh, uh, so what happens is you have to re redefine the scale factor of the turnaround, and that eventually gives this 1.3 trillion years. You have to take my word for that. So the way you can set this up in terms of the Friedman equations, of course you have to change general relativity at some stage, but the claim is that the Freeman equation, the expansion equation, or whatever you call it, which is the first term here, has to be changed only a very, very short time before the turnaround and a very, very short time after the bounce. And for example, this is not what we use, but just phenomenologically, you can take the Freeman equation and put in factors like this, which make the acceleration, make the expansion vanish or turn around and bounce like this. And these factors are one, exactly equal to one, except for a time extremely close to the bounce and extremely close to the turnaround. I'm not going to discuss where those factors come from. And in any case, we don't use them. Now, this is a very uh, cursory discussion of entanglement. Uh, just to try to explain Van Ramsdonk's interesting idea of why the uh, why the um, the connection between the entanglement entropy and the connectivity. So uh, this is ADS CFT. So excuse me. So supposing we have an ADS CFT correspondence, and we have two conformal field theories on the surface. And a general state of the system is a product of the A and B conformal field theories. Each of these are dual to a space-time, which initially, ab initio, are disconnected. Right? They're two different space-times. Now we consider an entangled state uh, combining states in the two conformal field theories. And, um, uh, what happens is that as they become entangled, the two space-time manifolds become connected. This can actually be made very quantitative, and you can change the entanglement parameter. And if you have, say, two spheres of space, they get connected by a sort of dumbbell. This, this can be calculated, and eventually, as the entanglement increases, the narrow part of the dumbbell gets bigger, and the, the cross-sectional area of this dumbbell is the entanglement entropy, or is proportional to the entanglement entropy, as defined by originally, I think, Ryu and Takaya Nagi in 2008. And there are, of course, many subsequent papers. But it's quite surprising that this Ryu Takaya Nagi, am I pronouncing his name anything like uh, it is? Uh, have this definition, which is a modification of the von Neumann entropy for this situation. And it has this property that classical space-time connectivity arises by quantum entangling the degrees of freedom in two components. This is an amazingly deep idea. I think this is the idea of Ren Van Ramsdonk in 2010. Now, if you follow that through, uh, this idea of entanglement entropy is a very big generalization of the idea of Bekenstein and Hawking for black holes, which is a very special case of this far more general definition of entropy. So it's very important to realize that the old Bekenstein-Hawking formulas are merely very special cases of this Ryu Takayanagi formula. <laughs> well, you're admiring my, my, 
Well, we have a Japanese, at least one in the audience. So, <laughs> Anyway, this is rather trivial. But just to remind you that if you have two qubits, uh, the most general state is like that. And the most general uh, probability of being in one of these states is normalized like that. Um, and <clears throat> but if you have two qubits, there is a very special formula, a spe very special state, which can be called the einstein rosen podolsky state or the Bell state. It was Bell worked on the einstein rosen podolsky paradox and so on. And this, this special state looks like that. Now this state is a very good illustration because what this state has the property that if you measure one of the qubits, you immediately know where the other qubit is. And this is an ex uh, a simple example of something which is impossible in classical theory, but happens in quantum theory. Okay. So in this cyclic cos cosmology we studied in 2007, uh, the question is, and I'll just say it in words because I probably don't have many minutes, but the, the idea in words is that um, as you get to the turnaround, you have a huge number of causally dis disconnected space times, or not necessarily disconnected. And the question is how to choose one of those to be the contracting universe with zero entropy. And what we said in 2007, well, you know, that it's causally disconnected to us. We just pick a patch which has no matter in it, and we choose that. But now in 2017, I saw 18, um, this becomes much more natural because the whole idea is to choose a s portion of space time to be the starting point of the contraction. And now all we require is to make the entanglement entropy between the in introverse and the extroverse, or between the introverse and the, excuse me, the extroverse and the visible universe, if you like. We make that entanglement entropy vanish. And then the extroverse becomes disconnected, classically, from the, uh, the visible universe. And so, as we say, it can be jettisoned with impunity. You can just throw it away because it's no longer part of the universe. So therefore, you end up with a universe with zero entropy, which then contracts adiabatically to the bounce with zero entropy and bounces and starts with zero entropy, which is good. It starts with the minimum possible entropy, and then it expands and again. So I think this is a step, a, a tiny step forward to resolving the, uh, the so-called Tolman Noko theorem. OK, I have how many? Five minutes? Ten minutes, Ten minutes including discussion. Including oh, OK, that's perfect. So let me go. I've already said uh, Tolman's work was uh, amazing, of course, in 1931. But I think finally, finally, <laughs> we're beginning to realize that his no-go theorem is, uh, can be overcome. It's taken almost 100 years, but maybe we will actually have a solution which evades Tolman's no-go theorem using entanglement entropy. So, so I want to go ahead. Oh, the great man is still here. So I'm going to briefly say this idea of dark matter being primordial intermediate mass black holes. So our proposal is that the Milky Way contains between 10 million and 10 billion massive black holes, each with between 100, actually between about 25 and say 100,000 times the solar mass. They are separated on average by um, between 100 and 1,000 light years. Now of the detection methods, the best we can think of is to extend the method of the so-called macho collaboration, which was done in the 1990s in Australia by Alcock et al., where they found microlensing curves. Now, they stopped prematurely at a, a, a 
light curve of duration about um, less than a year, about 300 days, something like that, which corresponds to about 25 solar masses. Now, the reason they stopped is they had no reason to believe there were heavier uh, machos than the sun. In fact, at that time, at least primordial black holes were assumed to be much lighter than the sun. We, know, we now know, since 2010 or approximately, how to make primordial black holes which are far heavier than the sun. Now, the telescope, we've studied all the telescopes in the world. Uh, it needs a wide field optical telescope, and it must be in the southern hemisphere because we want to scan the Magellanic Clouds, which are the ideal targets. And the best existing telescope, we believe, is the Blanco 4 meter telescope, which was fitted with a dark energy camera for looking at the dark energy. But generously, Fermilab has given the camera to the telescope, and they finished their dark energy survey. So there is an experiment already underway starting about a month ago. There's already been two nights of observation, and there will be 32 nights in the next two years in this telescope, using this telescope. Oh, that's not. Oh dear, now this is uh, okay. So uh, there is a um, the the team who are doing the experiment is actually coming from La Lawrence Livermore, including uh, George Chapline, who's one of my coworkers, <coughs> and it also is headed by somebody called um, Will Dawson. I think his name is Will Dawson. is a young astronomer, a brilliant astronomer at Livermore, and he is the leader of a group which are expert in analyzing this kind of data. This DE cam in two years will produce many terabytes of data, which doesn't sound much to the LHC experts, but it's quite a lot, and it has to be analyzed. So the idea, I hope it's clear, is to find light curves with a half width a width at half maximum of more than a year. Two years is even more interesting because it's 100 solar masses, and the duration goes like the square root of the mass. So d doubling the duration gives four times the mass. So the hope is that by the end of 2019, we will have evidence for 100 solar mass objects in the halo. And the only interpretation of that is that this is the, that I know is that this is the dark matter. So that's the uh, idea. Okay, thank you. I can stop. I know you want to have eat dinner. Yeah. Well, people are more interested in eating the banquets, I think. I missed how a dark energy camera functions. It looks at gravitational lensing? Yes. So the dark energy camera, it has 520 megapixels. Uh, I don't know the details of what the dark energy survey did, but after they did it for seven years, from 2011 to 2017, and have now ended. And as far as I understand, the result is that the dark energy has no time dependence Omega is minus one, and it's a cosmological constant. Uh, so we're using it, as you just said, to look at the stars in the Magellanic Cloud. We look at every star in the large and the small Magellanic Cloud. We look at it through three different filters to make sure it's uh, achromatic and therefore gravitational. We do two dithers. Does anyone know dithers are? This is you have to do it displaced by a few pixels to improve the spatial, spatial resolution. Apparently everyone says you have to do that. And we make 15 pointings. I think it's 13 at the large and two at the small Magellanic Cloud. And we do that every three weeks for the first two years. And of course, if we find something, we would presumably continue. <coughs> Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. Bye.
I have a comment that, uh, yeah, my comment. Well, it's comment or comment? Comment, remark. Comment. Ah, well, <laughs> uh, according to our chairman, remark. <coughs> so I have the following remark that uh, the model of creation of black holes with masses much larger than the solar mass was pro proposed in our paper with Joe Silk in 1993. So I will talk about that tomorrow. Oh, excellent. Well, could mm -hmm. you email me the reference? Uh, and I'll make sure it's in yes. the paper. Yes, just so. look in the archive Dolgov and Silk. Okay. Is it in the Inspire? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi. No, I just wanted to understand uh, a little bit more what is, uh, I mean, how this uh, theory of infinitely repeating s uh, cycles in the universe no? yeah. can be compatible with uh, with thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics. Because uh, as if I understood you correctly, there is an internal universe which uh, contracts, then it starts for it with the zero entropy, then it expands, right? Yes. And uh, at some point it, it, it contracts again. Uh, I don't know whether um, you know the, the 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 fact that an entropy diminishes again is compensated by the external universe, wh um, which perhaps increases uh, the entropy. Is that the idea? Yes, I'm glad you asked the question. So the but but if, uh, let me finish the question. Well, I can answer the question. And then you answer you everything. It, yes. But if this is the case, then don't I don't understand how the two universes talk each other. Are they uh, causally connected in order to... Oh, right. So for one to know uh, well, that the other is violating the, the second uh, law of thermodynamics and such that the overall universe uh, yeah. preserves it? Well, of course, we never violate the second law of thermodynamics. That would be a serious mistake. And the total entropy of everything is always increasing. But, and in fact, the second law of... Well, I'm not talking about the dark... You're talking about the cyclic cosmology. These are sort of related. In the cyclic cosmology, the entire idea is that at the turnaround, all the entropy of the visible universe is dumped into the extraverse. And not only th that was already in the old model, but now we have the added uh, advantage that the extraverse is disconnected completely. So we can keep only the visible universe with zero entropy. And as we always say, we can jettison the extraverse with impunity. The, old, the worry of, about the old model is what do you do? In fact, we had an infiniverse in the old model because we kept making more universes. And now we only have one universe, visible universe for the whole infinite time. Because all the other almost infinite number of universes, which in the old model were a multiverse or infiniver infiniverse, can be thrown out. I think he wants to go to the banquet. Another question? We all know that there is always a previous Russian paper. In the case of uh, primordial black holes, those were first invented by Novikov and Zeldovich about a hundred years ago. 1967. Before Carr and Hawking is 1974, and uh, Sasha Dolgoff is nodding his head vigorously. It was 1967 of Novikov and uh, Zeldovich, exactly right. Which was, I think, to be fair, unknown to Carr and Hawking. At least they tell me, or Carr told me, they didn't know. Although it was seven years earlier, you may know who knew what uh, and when. Well, no, <laughs> Alvaro is very uh, modest. Well, I think we should go the last. last yeah, very short. The bank, the bank which can, can you uh, <laughs> can you have the? Would you like to have the, our visible universe in one quantum state? Would you like to have our universe in one quantum state? Well, not at the present time. Oh, it still can be. <laughs> no, no, Maybe it still can be. 
how would we have a banquet if we were only in one quantum state? Okay. Is that no, a good no, answer? No, I mean, locally you can be a C st statistic, <laughs> but globally it still can be one quantum state. Well, we can discuss over yes. the banquet. Yeah. It's a very, good, know, very, good, very good question. We'll have to really. stop it here. Uh, thank uh, also Paul Trapp. Thank you. For his talk. Thank you.